the audience and distinguished guests, I want to welcome you to today's uh, commemorative program. 70 years ago, the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto took up against German troops to delay the liquidation of the ghetto and their deportation to Majdanek and Treblinka. Less than a thousand ill-armed Jews attacked the invading police, army and SS forces. Units which, in terms of quantity, armory, and supplies, were many times superior. The battle between Jewish inmates and German occupiers lasted 27 days. Armed resistance against the Germans was virtually unknown in any of the hundreds of ghettos and camps around Poland. Until today, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which ultimately failed, is considered as a quintessence of Jewish resistance. You will hear today that not all Germans serving in the German army condone the systematic violence against the Jews. One learns with relief that there were individuals who were different and one is thankful today for their moral uprightness. Due to last week's terror act at the Boston Marathon and the following string of incidents, our program, which was planned for April 19, had to be postponed. I'm very thankful that the artist could arrange another alternative date. So here we are. Who are the artists? The narrator and producer of the program is Dr. Susanne Klingenstein. Susanne was born in Germany and studied European literature, history, and philosophy at the universities of Heidelberg, Brandeis, and Harvard. She is the author of scholarly works on American Jewish culture and a regular contributor to the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, which is our most important in cultural terms, and the Weekly Standard. The pianist is Eugenia Gerstein. Eugenia was born and raised in Moscow. She studied piano at the Moscow Music School and music education and choral conducting at the Pedagogical College of Music in Moscow. She went on to specialize in music theory and choral conducting at Ural Ural State Conservatory. In Sverdlovsk, a school unusually receptive to Jewish students. Uh, in 19, 1994, she gave up her ac academic career in music theory to come to Boston. So that her son, Kirill Gerstein, then age 14, could accept an invitation to study at the Berkeley College of Music. He was the youngest student ever. She established a successful studio for piano and vocal performance, continues to conduct adult and children choirs, and teaches music at the Solomon Schlechter Day School of Greater Boston. Vocalist is Sophie Michaud. Sophie Michaud. Sophie was born in London and raised at the French Alp. She studied at the Haute École de Musique in Genève, Switzerland and at the Longy School of Music in Cambridge. In 2010, she was a soloist at the Egida Sartori and Laura Alvini Early Music Festival in Venice and a finalist at the Favas Grand Corpus de Chant in Austin, <coughs> Texas. Among her many opera performances are mostly recently the roles of Hermia in Benjamin Britten's Midsummer's Night's Dream and of Mercedes in Georges Bizet Carmen in May, coming May. Ronald Crutcher is not only a remarkable cellist and a member of the Klemberg Trio, he is also the president of Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts. And he speaks German fluently. He studied musicology at the University of Bonn and music the conservatory in Frankfurt. In 1979, he became the first cellist to receive a doctorate degree in musical arts from Yale University. 
after holding high offices at the Cleveland Institute of Music, the University of Texas at Austin, and at the Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, he accepted the presidency of Wheaton College in 2005. He made his Carnegie Hall debut in 1985 and has been performing regularly as a cellist of the Clampera Trio in America and in Europe. I am deeply thankful that you could come together to commemorate the day of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Please welcome now Susanna, Susanne, who lead you through the program. Thank you very much. On Friday, April 19th, the precise 70th anniversary of the armed uprising staged by the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto against the Germans who had returned to kill them, the city of Boston and several neighboring communities were locked down because authorities were searching for one of the men responsible for the bombing of the Boston Marathon. This afternoon, as we remember the 400,000 Jews of Warsaw, we include in our thoughts the men, women, and children who were killed or injured in their bodies and souls because they were attending an American sports event. They were attacked because they were celebrating Patriots Day by lending support to an American sport that had its roots in ancient Greece. In late August of the year 490 BC, the messenger Phidippides ran from the battlefield of Marathon all the way to Athens to announce that the Persians had been defeated. April 19th, the day of this year's Boston Marathon, is also on a significant day in American history. The shot heard around the world was fired on that day at the battles of Lexington and Concord as American colonists took on British troops and set off the American Revolutionary War that led to America's independence. 70 years ago, April 19th, fell on the first day of Passover, a holiday that commemorates the exodus of the Jews from the enslavement in Egypt and their own march toward independence. It's uncanny with what precision the Germans managed to choose major Jewish holidays such as Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, or even Passover to begin yet another murderous assault. This afternoon, we recount the story of the Warsaw Ghetto. It is difficult to tell it in a mere 80 minutes. As you can see in your programs, I split the story into six segments. Each of the segments highlights one aspect of the ghetto's history. Each segment will conclude with a set of Yiddish songs, most of them written by <coughs> song. I want to thank again uh, my friends who are here and have worked very diligently with me on the program. I want to mention also uh, Dr. Philip Kraft, who will be uh, reciting or reading or uh, performing for us the documents that I picked to illustrate the Warsaw Ghetto. I also want to thank again Sophie. Uh, Eugenia and Ronald uh, for being here and for working with me on this program. Jews have lived in Warsaw <coughs> since the year 1414. 500 years later, in 1914, Warsaw had nearly 900,000 inhabitants, 38% of whom were Jews. It was the most modern Jewish city in Europe. Social, educational, religious, political, and literary organizations had their headquarters there. Jewish literature and the Jewish press flourished in Warsaw. In the 1920s and 1930s, Yiddish theaters and cabarets were thriving, and a new generation of Yiddish writers came along. Among them was Isaac Bashevi Singer, who would receive the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1978. Warsaw was the epicenter of modern Jewish culture. In 1939, 380,000 Jews were living in Warsaw. In October 1940, when the Warsaw Ghetto was established, there were 400,000 Jews. Warsaw had one of the most diverse Jewish populations in Europe, ranging from entirely assimilated Jews, who considered themselves really poles of the Mosaic faith, to pious Hasidim, who had only recently come to the city from one of the smaller Polish hinterlands, the shuttles in the hinterlands. There's a famous bitter funny line about this diversity in Cynthia Ozick's brilliant Holocaust story, The Shah. Rosa, a survivor of the camps who used to belong to the highly educated Polish intelligentsia, says to another survivor of the camps, a man named Herchik, 
who used to be part of the poor Yiddish-speaking masses, your Warsaw is not my Warsaw. The Jewish population of Warsaw was deeply divided by culture and class, by religion and politics. You will hear now two songs from the interwar period. The first song was written by Henrik Kohn around 1924, a year that we will come back to at the very end of the program. It became a smash hit in the Yiddish theater. It is called Spiel Shemira Lirde in Yiddish, which means play for me a Jewish song. The lyrics tell you that a truly Jewish song is dreamy, emotional, and utopian. A truly Jewish song expresses longing for peace and universal brotherhood. And I quote from the song because you don't have the text, unfortunately, in front of you. It was sort of left out of the program. Play me a song about peace, and may it be real peace and not an illusion. May all nations, great and small, live without wars. Let us sing the little song together as good friends, as children of one mother. Spiel schmier Lidl wegen Schollen, so schein Schollen nicht gehen Schollen, als Felke groß und klein, so ein Kennen das Verstehen, ohne Kriegen und Milchames sich begehen. Everybody in Warsaw knew this song and remembered its utopian dreaminess all too well when the Germans arrived and began hunting the Jews. Many Jews escaped into the Polish countryside where they were digging deep holes in which to hide from the Germans. Those holes were called Kriyufkas, or in another pronunciation, Kravaikas. As the Jews were hiding in them, the old song about their longing for universal brotherhood came back to them like a bit of hiccup, and they made up a new text it describes the total disintegration of all the universalist illusions. I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, before the war I lived in peace, along came Hitler and murdered the Jews. We were peaceful, the same as everybody else. In what way have we sinned, I ask you? This new text too became a smash hit. The song traveled very quickly to many other ghettos. After the war, Henrik Kohn learned that his old song from 1924 had gotten a new text and a new life in the ghetto. For this new version, he composed an arrangement that he published in 1963 on the 20th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. It is this arrangement that you will hear this afternoon. The second song was also written for the Yiddish Theater in Warsaw in the early 1920s. It is called, Wo ahin soll ich gehen? Where, where should I go to? and reflects the Jews' awareness that in a world where anti-Semitism is on the rise, they have no place to go. The melody was composed by Oskar Strock, who was known as the king of the Russian tango. Among his 300 compositions of tangos is also the most famous Ochi Czerny, like eyes. The words to Wohin soll ich gehen were written by Igor Korntire, who was a brilliant actor and poet. Among the many plays that he translated into Yiddish was also Shakespeare's Othello. He was caught in the Warsaw Ghetto and deported to Auschwitz in 1942, where he was killed upon arrival.
The Germans arrived in Warsaw on September 29, 1939, just four weeks after they had invaded Poland. Right away, they began to decimate the Polish intelligentsia and to terrorize and abuse the Jews in the streets, especially those who looked either orthodox or upper class. Jewish shops, businesses, and art collections were looted. Jewish apartments were confiscated. Jewish property that had been hidden was dug up by Germans who were guided by Polish informers. All Jewish assets were frozen in the banks. A 24-member Jewish council, a Judenrat, was appointed. Its job was to carry out all German orders, most notably the recruitment of forced laborers. Jews were required to wear on their right arm a white and blue band with the Star of David. They were forbidden to enter public parks, to use public transportation, or gather for services. They were fired from their jobs, beaten up in the streets, and they were issued ration cards for tiny amounts of food. Meanwhile, Jewish refugees from the countryside were streaming into Warsaw. On October 12, 1940, the eve of Yom Kippur, the Germans ordered the establishment of a ghetto in the heart of the Jewish quarter in the north of Warsaw. On November 16, 1940, the ghetto was sealed off. 400,000 Jews were cooped up in an area that occupied 2% of Warsaw. Each apartment housed an average of 28 people. Six to seven people lived in one room. Since more and more Jews were fleeing from the countryside to the city, the population increased and reached 460,000 in March of 1941. After that, the numbers fell rapidly due to starvation, disease, and abuse. In July 1942, the deportations began. In the first year of the ghetto, having money made an enormous difference. Noemi schatz weinkons kept a diary in Polish, and she made these observations. We are beggars, but there are also people who have money. Admittedly, they are a small handful, but if one person has money, then another can always earn his keep from him and provide a livelihood for someone else. And that is how the restaurants, nightclubs, and open-air cabarets started up. There are the great walls of the ghetto, starvation and death at every step, but in the basements there are places of amusements, luchs, the bear, the glistening brilliance of mirrors and marble, of silver and crystal. Our excellent musicians play, and the stars perform new acts as well as their old ones. The young singer, with the voice of a nightingale, sings so beautifully, that it is as if the ghetto never existed, as if nobody knew what a German was. On a tray, they serve coffee and cakes, or a tasty scented pink mousse and sugared almonds. And later, when you go out from the lovely, brightly lit room into the dark street, and two words reach your ears, Hotrachmunas, have pity, and you see the emaciated body wearing rags, then you rue the pleasant moments spent in the nightclubs, call yourself a heartless brute, and realize that people can listen to music and songs, they can luxuriate in the warmth and brightness, but they can no longer dance. So nobody dances in our nightclubs. Clearly, the line has to be drawn somewhere. The two songs you will hear now were written during the first weeks of the ghetto's existence. Both are about money. The first song, Moes Moes, is set to an American jazz tune and has many sarcastic verses. We picked just a few of them. Education and skills don't matter anymore. Only the baker sits high on the horse by the felt. In the old days, the singer ate oranges. Now the lice and bedbugs eat her. If you don't have money, you might as well give up your ration card and hop into the undertaker's box. The second song, Abschnarita, is about a day spent begging. There were thousands of beggars in the ghetto because there was so little work. The woman in this song, however, must have been begging outside the ghetto walls because she talks about having to smuggle the bread, meat, and potatoes through the gate back into the ghetto, which costs her half a bottle of vodka. At home, the children erupt in joy when they see her full sack. When the stove is hot and the stomach doesn't hurt, and your feet are not frozen, one could almost forget one is a Jew whose fate is suffering. Thank you. 
many descriptions of the Warsaw Ghetto. You will hear now two of them. The first description was written by Vladislav Spielmann, a pianist whose life was saved by a German officer, Wilhelm Rosenfeld. Spielmann became the subject of a film by Roman Polanski. In his memoir entitled The Pianist, Spielmann describes his commute to work inside the ghetto during the summer of 1941. Only once I was safely across Cordon Street did I see the ghetto as it really was. Its people had no capital, no secret valuables. They earned their bread by trading. The further you went into the labyrinth of narrow alleys, the livelier and more urgent the trade was. Women with children clinging to their skirts would accost passers-by, offering a few cakes for sale on a piece of cardboard. They represented the entire fortune of such women, and whether their children had a small piece of black bread to eat that evening depended on their sale. Old Jews, emaciated beyond recognition, tried to draw your attention to some sort of rags from which they hoped to make money. Young men traded gold and notes, fighting bitter and rancorous battles over battered watch cases, the ends of chains, or worn and dirty dollar bills that they held up to the light, announcing that they were flawed and worth almost nothing, although the sellers insisted passionately that they were almost like new. The horse-drawn trams, known as Kanheloriki, made their way through the crowded streets with a clattering and ringing of bells, the horses and shafts dividing the crowd of human bodies as a boat makes its way through the water. The nickname came from the tram proprietors, Cohn and Heller, two Jewish magnates who were in the service of the Gestapo and did a flourishing trade through it. The fares were quite high, so only the prosperous took these trams, coming into the center of the ghetto solely on business. When they got out at the tram stops, they tried to be as quick as possible in making their way through the streets to the shop or office where they had an appointment taking another tram immediately afterwards so as to leave this terrible quarter at speed. Merely getting from the tram stop to the nearest shop was not easy. Dozens of beggars lay in wait for this brief moment of encounter with a prosperous citizen, mobbing him by pulling at his clothes, barring his way, begging, weeping, shouting, threatening. But it was foolish for anyone to feel sympathy and give a beggar something, for then the shouting would rise to a howl. That signal would bring more and more wretched figures streaming up from all sides. And the good Samaritan would find himself besieged, hemmed in by ragged apparitions, spraying him with tubercular saliva, by children covered with oozing sores who were pushed into his path, by gesticulating stumps of arms, blinded eyes, toothless, stinking, open mouths, all begging for mercy at this, the last moment of their lives, as if their end could be delayed only by instant support. To get to the center of the ghetto, you had to go down Karmelitska Street, the only way there. It was downright impossible not to brush against other people in the street here. The dense crowd of humanity was not walking, but pushing and shoving its way forward, forming whirlpools in front of stalls and bays outside doorways. A chilly odor of decay was given off by unaired bedclothes, old grease and rubbish rotting in the streets. At the slightest provocation, the crowd would become panic-stricken, rushing from one side of the street to the other, choking, pressing close, shouting and cursing. Kamalitska Street was a particularly dangerous place. Prison cars drove down it several times a day. They were taking prisoners, invisible behind gray steel sides and small opaque glass windows, from the Paviak jail to the Gestapo center in Shuch Ali. And on the return journey, they brought back what remained of them after their interrogation. Bloody scraps of humanity with broken bones and beaten kidneys, their fingernails torn out. The escort of these cars allowed no one near them, although the cars themselves were armored. When they turned into Karmelitska Street, 
which was so crowded that with the best will in the world, people could not take refuge in doorways, the Gestapo men would lean out and beat the crowd indiscriminately with truncheons. This would not have been especially dangerous had they been ordinary rubber truncheons, but those used by the Gestapo men were studded with nails and razor blades. Spielmann was 31 years old at the time and had lived in the Warsaw Ghetto from the moment it had been established. He saw the deprivation and the misery but he no longer had a sense of how utterly absurd, how outlandish, how incomprehensibly beastly it was that 400,000 perfectly normal, healthy, educated people had been locked up and were slowly worked and starved to death. In the late summer of 1942, an extraordinary young Pole, tall, blonde, and beautiful, was smuggled into the Warsaw Ghetto. Take a look around. Jan Karski had studied politics and diplomacy before the war. He fought near Osjensim when the Germans invaded Poland. He was caught by the Russians, exchanged for a German POW, and managed to escape from a train that was bringing him to a German POW camp. He made his way back to Warsaw to join the Polish resistance. In the summer of 1942, Karski was thinking about taking up again his position as a secret courier between the Polish underground and the Polish government in exile in London. Two Jewish leaders, who lived as disguised as Gentiles on the Aryan side, learned about it and arranged a meeting with Karski. They begged him to go into the ghetto and to look around so that he could report to the world that Hitler was intent on killing the Jews. Karski agreed to go. In August 1942, when Karski entered the ghetto through a secret tunnel, the deportations had already begun. Is it still necessary to describe the Warsaw Ghetto? So much has already been written about it. There have been so many accounts by unimpeachable witnesses. A cemetery? No, for these bodies were still moving, were indeed often violently agitated. They were still living people, if you could call them such. For apart from their skin, eyes, and voice, there was nothing human left in these palpitating figures. Everywhere there was hunger, misery, the atrocious stench of decomposing bodies, the pitiful moans of dying children, the desperate cries and gasps of a people struggling for life against impossible odds. To pass that wall was to enter into a new world utterly unlike anything that had ever been imagined. The entire population of the ghetto seemed to be living in the street. There was hardly a square yard of empty space. As we picked our way across the mud and rubble, the shadows of what had once been men or women flitted by us in pursuit of someone or something, their eyes blazing with some insane hunger or greed. Everyone and everything seemed to vibrate with unnatural intensity, to be in constant motion, enveloped in a haze of disease and death through which their bodies appeared to be throbbing in disintegration. We passed an old man standing against the wall, staring lugubriously and with glassy eyes into space. And although he barely moved from his spot, he too seemed to be strangely animated, his body tormented by a force that made his skin twitch in little areas. As we walked, everything became increasingly unreal. The names of streets, shops, and buildings had been printed in the old Hebrew characters. My guides informed me that an edict had been issued forbidding the use of German or Polish for any inscriptions in the ghetto. As a result, many of the inhabitants could not read the names at all. From time to time, we passed a well-fed German policeman who looked abnormally bloated by contrast with the meagerness of those who surrounded him. Each time one approached, we hastened our steps or crossed to the other side as though we had been contaminated. Frequently, we passed by corpses lying naked in the streets. What does it mean? I asked my guide. Why are they lying there naked? 
When a Jew dies, he answered, his family removes his clothing and throws his body in the street. If not, they have to pay the Germans to have the body buried. They've instituted burial tax, which practically no one here can afford. Besides, this saves clothing. Here, every rag counts. I shuddered. A phrase came to my mind which I had heard often and thought I had never fully comprehended till that moment. Ecce homo. Behold the man. I saw an old, feeble man staggering along, lurching against the walls of the houses to keep from falling. I don't see many old people, I said. Do they stay inside all day? The answer came in a voice that seemed to issue from the grave. No. Don't you understand the German system yet? Those whose muscles are still capable of any effort are used for forced labor. The others are murdered by quota. First come the sick and aged, then the unemployed, then whose, those whose work is not directly connected with the German war needs, finally those who work on roads, in trains, in factories, ultimately they intend to kill us all. Hexa homo, behold the man, are of course the words Pontius Pilate uses in the Latin translation of the Gospel of John, when Pilate presents the tortured figure of Jesus to a hostile crowd which demands his execution. Karski, a committed Catholic, used these words in his report in 1944 with bitter irony. For him, the Jews were collectively, have collectively become an incarnation of the tortured Christ. They have become figures of pathos and pity, abandoned by mankind, and they were, they were testing the humanity of the observer. Kosky did make it to London, and even later snared an interview with President Roosevelt. Kosky became deeply embittered by the, com by the complete futility of his insistent pleas that the free world help the Jews and Poles. Kosky stayed in America and became a professor of political science at Georgetown University. He did not speak about his experience in World War II, until Claude Lanzmann came to interview him for his 1985 film, Shoah. The April 18 edition of the Jewish online magazine, The Tablets, of just a few days ago, featured an article about an 800-page diary written in the Warsaw Ghetto in Hebrew that has lain for 70 years in a leather satchel in Israel. The writer, Reuven Felchu, answers Karski's question, why the dead lie naked in the streets? In February 1942, Felchu wrote, The street is teeming with sights so maddening, so depraved, that it is hard to find an equivalent in the treasury of humanity's degradation. There is no doubt that the, den the denizens of the jungle and animals will never behave like this. The dead are naked. When someone had just starved, they cover him in wrapping paper and lie him down on the sidewalk and at night his friends, or just beggars, walk out and undress him completely and leave him all naked with no shoes, no dress, or even underwear. In the morning, as you go out in the street and the wind blows off the wrapping papers covering the dead, you see the organs of men, women, and children, all scrawny, the quivered organs of death in the street. You see the naked bodies, frozen, stuck to the sidewalk. The body becomes one with the stone congealed, one dead chum screaming with poverty and disgust. After the war, witness reports and diaries began to appear. Among the most unusual testimonies of what occurred in the ghetto are the poems of Reuben Lifshitz. Several of them were set to music and acquired the status of folk songs. You will hear two of them. Reuben Lifshitz was born in Warsaw in 1918. He was a satirist and wrote for the Polish theater. He switched to writing in Yiddish only after he was imprisoned in the Warsaw Ghetto, where he continued to compose poems and sarcastic essays. I don't know how he survived the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto, but in 1946, we find him in Bergen-Belsen, where he published a book of poetry containing some of the poems that he had written in Warsaw. Three years later, he published another volume of Yiddish poems in Munich, where, strangely enough, he called himself Richard Liebschutz, 
In 1950, Lifshitz emigrated to America. The lyrics for the two songs you will hear now are based on Lifshitz poems. Der Hoyt Singer von Barcheva Ghetto describes the phenomenon of the singing beggar. Sometimes whole families would appear in a courtyard and sing until people opened their windows and threw them some bread or money. Der Hoyt Singer von Barcheva Ghetto is a chilling portrait of despair. It was written late in the existence of the ghetto, probably in March 1943, because it mentions the possibility that tomorrow the singer might be in Treblinka. Ich drehe die Kaderinke und spiel heint veracht mit Courage, weil morgen, von seine Treblinka, wird lernt von mir abagasch. I turned a hurdy-gurdy and play with courage for you today, because tomorrow I'll probably be turned to ash in Treblinka. The second song, Motele von Warsawa Ghetto, is a portrait of a starved boy of whom there were a great many in Warsaw. He's the son, of, the son of a tailor who was going around, shriveled up and in rags. This song, too, is about a very late phase in the existence of the ghetto because the street names that are mentioned in the third stanza, Jika, Pava, Mille, Niska, Gensha, are the streets to which the ghetto had been reduced in 1943. The third stanza describes cannons being fired and fighting on the barricades. So it is possible that the song is said during the armed uprising that began on April 19, 1943. Muttel is killed on the barricades. He was 12 years old. Thank you. 
The deportations began on July 22, 1942. With their uncanny sense for significant Jewish dates, the Germans had picked a day before Tisha B'Av, the ninth day in the month of Av, which is a traditional day of mourning for the destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem and the beginning of exile. The deportations lasted until the 12th of September and proceeded at a steady clip. German records show that the SS men of Einsatz Reinhardt put in a total of 45 workdays, during which they rounded up 253,000 Jews, or an average of 5,400 Jews a day. On September 12, when the SS packed up its gear, the Germans saw that there were 50,000 Jews left in the ghetto. The real number was closer to 73,000, because Jews managed to hide in every nook and cranny of the ghetto. These illegal Jews were called white cats, and they were totally dependent on their fellow Jews for food and shelter. Early in the morning on July 22, 1942, a Wednesday, the first day of the deportations, the walls and gates of the ghetto were placed under the guard of special forces of the Polish Blue Police and Ukrainian, Lithuanian, and Latvian support troops. At 10 a.m., Sturmbannführer Hermann Höfle, a 31-year-old Austrian, appeared with his aides in the office of the Judenrat, the Jewish Council, which governed the ghetto. The head of the Jewish Council was 62-year-old engineer Adam Chernyakov. His job was to ensure the functioning of the ghetto and to deal with the Germans. Chernyakov was a calm and methodical man. He's always described as a bit vain. He had studied in Dresden and had admired German culture. On July 22, 1942, Hermann Höfle came to his office, handed him the death sentence of the Jews of Warsaw, and asked him to facilitate its execution. In Chernyakov's diary, the entry July 22, 1942, is matter of fact, as are all his other entries in the diary. in the morning at 7.30 at the community. The borders of the small ghetto surrounded by a special unit in addition to the regular one. Sturmbahn Führer Höfler and associates came at 10 o'clock. We disconnected the telephone. Children were moved from the playground opposite the community building. We were told that all the Jews, irrespective of sex and age, with certain exceptions, will be deported to the east. By 4 p.m. today, a contingent of 6,000 people must be provided, and this, at the minimum, will be the daily quota. We were ordered to vacate the building at 103 Zawazna Street for the German personnel who will be carrying out the deportation. The furniture was kept where it was. As the council staff with their wives and children are exempted from deportation, I ask that the JSS personnel, craftsmen, and garbage collectors, etc., also be excluded. This was granted. I requested the release of Gepner, Rosen, Stolzmann, Trebinski, Winter, Kobrina, which was approved. By 3.45 p.m., everyone but Rosen is already back in the ghetto. In the afternoon, Lakin sent a message that a piece of glass had allegedly been thrown at a police car. They warned us that if this were to happen again, our hostages would be shot. The most tragic dilemma is the problem of children in orphanages, etc. I raised this issue. Perhaps something can be done. At 5.30, one of the officials drove in and demanded that Joseph Ehrlich should be named Lakin's deputy. Ehrlich is already wearing three stars. Sturmbannführer Höfler, plenipotentiary in charge of deportation, asked me into his office and informed me that for the time being, my wife was free, but if the deportation were impeded in any way, she would be the first one to be shot as a hostage. There's only one more entry in Chernyakov's diary. July 23rd, 1942, in the morning at the community. Vortov from the deportation staff came and we discussed several problems. 
he exempted the vocational school students from deportation, the husbands of working women as well. He told me to take up the matter of orphans with Hofla. The same with reference to craftsmen. When I asked for the number of days per week in which the operation would be carried on, the answer was seven days per week. Throughout the town, a great rush to start new workshops. A sewing machine can save a life. It is 3 o'clock. So far, 4,000 are ready to go. The orders are that there must be 9,000 by 4 o'clock. Some officials came to the post office and issued direct instructions that all incoming letters and parcels be diverted to the Paviac jail. That last entry in Chernyakov's diary was written at 3 p.m. A few hours later, Chernyakov killed himself by swallowing one of the 24 cyanide capsules, capsules he kept in his desk for emergencies, one for each member of the Jewish Council. He also left two short letters. One was addressed to his wife, saying, They order me to kill the children of my nation with my own hands. There's nothing left for me but to die. The second letter was addressed to the Jewish Council. They order me to transport, to, to prepare the transports of children. I cannot take it any longer. I cannot allow the death of innocent children. This is why I decided to do away with myself. This is not cowardice or escape. I'm powerless. My heart is splitting from sorrow and compassion, and I cannot bear this any longer. My deed will show the truth to all, and maybe it will encourage the right actions. I am aware that I am leaving you with a difficult legacy. The effect of the announcements of the deportation in the ghetto was maddening devastation. Rumors spread right away, and I'll quote one more time from the diary that was just found in Israel, uh, written by Reuven Felshu. He notes on July 22, 1942, at half past ten, the rumor is spreading. Suddenly, from underground, deportation, deportation of the Jews of Warsaw, all of Warsaw, half of Warsaw, 100,000, 200,000, only the foreigners, only the beggars, everyone except the officials. Deportation, deportation, then like madmen, like people on fire, everyone started to run. Half a million people running to the community building, from the community building hall, to the police, to the relatives, to strangers. Everyone is running, running, running. Deportation, deportation. What we have feared has come to pass. Vernichtung, extermination. Commando, deportation. We ran home, we fell into each other's arm, we hugged, we kissed, we beat one another farewell forever. We swore not to be separated, but to die together, to run away, to go into hiding together. The city burst into tears, the sound of which was certainly heard all over the world, but not on high. Deportation, right, every child, every old person, every stone, every wall, every sidewalk. The street shook as if millions of terrified demons had jumped on it, and we were running and being pushed. Chernyakov was obsessed with the fate of orphans, not being able to get an exemption from the deportation for the children in the orphanage pushed him over the edge. The fate of Jewish children in Nazi-occupied territories was indeed beyond horrifying. Two songs from this period reflect the Jews' awareness that the destination of their resettlement was death in Treblinka. The first song, Schluff mein Kind, is a lullaby in which the child is told that her father will not return because he was deported to the gas chambers. The second song, Treblinka, describes the deportations to Treblinka. We do not know who wrote these songs.
One survivor reported they were incapable of feeling any emotions. The ghetto was changed. Children and old people were gone. Men now outnumbered women. The Jewish council and the Jewish police were disempowered. The mood in the ghetto had changed too. Gradually, hatred of the Germans was rising to a boil, and thoughts of revenge were becoming intense. The Jewish fighting organization, Judovska Organizatia Boyova, and the revisionist Jewish military union, Chudovsky Sviazek Weiskovi, prepared to resist further German raids into the ghetto. Between September 1942 and January 1943, the Germans left the ghetto alone and even appeared to tolerate the emergence of the illegals, the so-called white cats, from their hiding places. But on January 18, 1943, a day which the Jews later called the unsuspecting Monday, the Germans started the second Aktion. Although the prolonged war on the Eastern Front left the Wehrmacht disastrously short of manpower, and every Jew would have been useful as forced labor in producing material for the German war effort, Heinrich Himmler, safely ensconced in Berlin, insisted that the illegals be removed from the Warsaw Ghetto. 8,000 Jews would have to be caught and deported. This time, the Jews were prepared to resist. First of all, they did not show up when the Germans commanded them to assemble. Most of them went into hiding instead. When the Germans finally managed to round up several hundred Jews and were marching them to the Umschlagplatz to be counted before boarding the trains to Treblinka, a group of men from the Jo, the Jewish fighting organization, showed up, commanded by the 23-year-old Mordecai Anjelevich. The historian Yisrael Gutmann who was then 19 years old and a member of the Jo, describes what happened during the first open battle with the Germans on the corner of Mila and Zamenhof Street. The first group involved in the January fighting was a band of Hashomer Hatzaiya members commanded by Mordechai Anilevich. Armed with pistols and hand grenades, the group attached itself to a long procession of Jews being led to the Umschlagplatz. The fighters dispersed along the length of this march, and each of its members singled out one of the soldiers guarding the line. At a given signal, the fighters sprang out of line and opened fire. A short battle followed with a number of Germans killed and wounded, while others fled. It is therefore understandable that no account of the battle or the casualties can be found in any German source. Most of the Jewish fighters fell as well. <coughs> Eliyahu Rozhansky, who had assassinated Lakin, fought with great valor in this incident, was seriously wounded and died of his wounds. Margalit Landau, who was also involved in that assassination, likewise fell in this battle. Anilevich himself fought until his ammunition ran out, then snatched a gun out of the hands of a German soldier and was saved by the intervention of another quick-witted fighter. The remaining Jewish fighters tried to barricade themselves in a small house on Niska Street, but the Germans set fire to the building. Finally, the battle was decided only after German reinforcements had been brought in.
the January attacks on the Germans during the second Aktion seemed to accomplish very little. The Germans still managed to flush out about 5,000 Jews from their hiding places. Nevertheless, the effect of these battles on the mood in the ghetto was enormous, because this time the Jews had not gone to their deaths like sheep to slaughter, and the Germans had not managed to fill their assigned quota of 8,000 Jews. Yitzhak Zuckerman, one of the leaders of the uprising that was to follow about three months later, said the January, the January revolt made the April revolt possible. The ghetto fighters emerged from their experience in January with the feeling, as Marek Edelman, another ghetto fighter, put it, it is possible to kill Germans and not die. Germans can be defeated. After the January success, the Jewish fighting organization got very busy, reorganizing itself, buying weapons from the Polish underground, building shelters and bunkers and escape routes over the roofs of the ghetto buildings. Between January 19 and April 18, everything remained quiet in the ghetto. No Germans. The Germans returned on April 19, 1943. This time, their order from Heinrich Himmler was to finish off the Jews and to liquidate the ghetto. The commander on the German side was SS and Polizeiführer Jürgen Stroh. He sent in SS units, police units, and regular army and foreign troops, averaging about 2,000 men for each day of the fighting. They were equipped like regular fighting units with armored vehicles, some light French tanks, cannons, flamethrowers, anti-aircraft weapon, heavy machine guns. They were opposed by 750 Jews, not all of whom even had a revolver. On the first day of the fighting, each Jogue fighter received 10 to 15 bullets, and four or five hand grenades. The Jogue probably had about 2,000 grenades and 2,000 Molotov, to Molotov cocktails, all told. The Germans had picked another significant day for the final assault. April 19 was the first day of Passover. On April 18, at 1 a.m., the Jews became aware of massive movement on the German side and immediately went into a state of high alert. At 4 a.m., Simcha Atheiser, on guard duty at the brush, in the brushmaker's area, observed the German entry at Nalewski Street. An hour later, Chaim Firmer, a fighter in Pearl Brado's squad, saw the German in deployment in another part of the ghetto. He also observed and reported about the first battle. At five this morning, a loud rumble was heard. Suddenly, I saw from my lookout on the balcony that cars had come through the ghetto gate. I reached the square, stopped, and soldiers got out and stood to the side. Then a truck arrived carrying tables and benches. The distance between me and the cars was about 200 meters, and since I had good binoculars, I could see them clearly. The tables were set up in a D shape. Wires were laid and telephones were placed on them. Other cars came with soldiers bearing machine guns. The motorcycle riders arrived, and some ambulances and light tanks could be seen <coughs> stopping by the entrance. The Latvians, who had been standing there through the night, were removed and sent en masse in the direction of the Umschlagplatz. At six, a column of infantry entered. One section of the column turned into Wawinska Street, and the other remained in place as if awaiting orders. Before long, the Jewish police came through the gate. They were lined up on both sides of the street and, as ordered, began to advance toward us. I would report everything to a fighter lying down not far from me, who in turn passed the word on to the command room where Mordechai, Yisrael, and others were seated. When the column of Jewish police reached our building, I asked how to proceed. Attack or not? The reply was to wait. Germans would surely follow, and the privilege of taking our fire belongs to them, and that's exactly what happened. After the Jewish police crossed the street, an armed German mobile column began to move. I was ordered to wait until the middle of the column had reached the balcony and then throw a grenade at it, which would serve as a signal to start the action. A mighty blast within the column was the signal to act, 
Immediately thereafter, grenades were thrown at the Germans from all sides, from all the positions on both sides of the street. Above the tumult of explosives and firing, we could hear the sputter of the German Schmeisser, operated by one of our men in the neighboring squad. I myself remained on the balcony and spewed forth fire from my Mauser onto the shocked and confused Germans. The battle lasted for about half an hour. The Germans retreated, leaving many dead and wounded in the street. Again, my eyes were peeled on the street, and then two tanks came in, followed by an infantry column. When the tank came up to our building, some Molotov cocktails and bombs put together from thick lead pipes were thrown at it. The big tank began to burn, and engulfed in flames, made its way toward the Umschlagplatz. The second tank remained in place as fire consumed it from every side. On the first day, April 19, only 580 Jews were caught, mostly at their places of work. But at night, the first night of Passover, the ghetto was free of Germans. At one point during the first day of fighting, two boys climbed up on a roof and unfurled two flags, a Polish flag in red and white, and a Jewish flag in blue and white. It was a symbolic act that saved no lives, but was of tremendous psychological and moral significance. It was clear that the Jewish resistance could neither last nor be successful. After four weeks of exhausting battles, the Jews were overwhelmed and crushed. Their hiding places were set on fire so that they had to come out. That's when the famous picture was taken of the little boy who raises his arms. On May 16, it was all over. As a final gesture, the Germans blew up the majestic Great Synagogue on Plomatskia Street. The Germans had killed 17,000 Jews right in the ghetto. In a final roundup, they sent 7,000 to Treblinka and 42,000 to Majdanek, near Lublin. The ghetto was liquidated. On May 16, Commander Stroh sent out his da last daily report to his superior in Krakow, and I quote, 180 Jews, bandits, and subhumans were destroyed. The former Jewish residential area of Warsaw no longer exists. The course action concluded with the blowing up of the Warsaw Synagogue at 8.15 p.m. The total number of Jews documented and confirmed killed is 56,065. No losses of our own. I will present the final report on May 18, 1943." Unquote. When he returned to his office the next day, Schlob collected all his daily reports he had written about the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto and added a slew of photographs documenting his work and sent a report to his superior in Krakow. On the cover, he carefully wrote in Gothic lettering the essential sentence from his report. Es gibt keinen jüdischen Wohnbezirk in Warsaw mehr. There is no Jewish district in Warsaw any longer. A copy of this report was found in Schlob's villa in Wiesbaden, Germany. He was clearly proud of his work. For his accomplishments in Warsaw, Schlob was awarded the Iron Cross first class. After the war, Schlob was tried in Warsaw and hanged by the Polish government on March 6, 1952. The song you will hear now commemorates the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. The lyrics were written by the poet Schmierke Kaczerginski. During the liquidation of the Vilna Ghetto in September 1943, he had escaped and joined the partisans in the forest around Vilna. In January 1944, while waiting for the Russian army to arrive in Vilna, he wrote the poem Avarsha to mark the first anniversary of the January 18 attack on the Germans by the Jews of Warsaw. The poem was set to music by Leon Weiner, who had been a prize-winning violin violinist before the war and had toured Europe all over. When the Germans invaded Poland, Weiner was called up to serve in the Polish army. He survived the war deep inside Russia. After the war, he met Kaczerginski in Argentina, and the two of them collaborated on a collection of 96 songs about the activities of the Jewish partisans in Poland. Warsha is one of them.
Many German officers were like Hermann Höfler and Jürgen Stroh, but some were different. One of them was Wilhelm Rosenfeld. In 1943, he was 48 years old. His integrity and innate sense of what was right and decent threw into sharp relief the inhumanity of those who participated in the murder of the Jews. Wilhelm Rosenfeld managed to remain unaffected by the Nazi ideology that reduced Slavs and Jews to subhumans. He had grown up in a semi-rural, small-town environment and in a conservative family with a strong commitment to Christianity and to the German fatherland. He did three years of battle duty in World War I and was drafted into the Wehrmacht in 1939. Rosenfeld was a practicing Catholic, which put him at odds with the Nazi ideology and its creation of a substitute religion. As a practicing Catholic, he was not able to see Polish fellow Catholics as subhumans. While stationed in Poland, he established friendships with several Polish families at great personal risk, assisted them as well as he could. In July 1940, Rosenfeld was stationed in Warsaw and remained there to the end of the war. He was captured by the Soviet army, tried and sentenced to 25 years of hard labor. He died a very sick man in a Russian labor camp on August 13, 1952. Yad Vashem recognized Rosenfeld in 2009 as a righteous among the nation, a chassid umot ha'ulam. While stationed in Warsaw, Rosenfeld kept a diary. You will hear now just two entries that show that it was possible not to get sucked into the Nazi orbit. Warsaw, August 13th, 1942. A Polish merchant from Posen, who was expelled from there at the beginning of the war, has a grocery store here in Warsaw. He often sells me vegetables and fruit and things like that. In the First World War, he served for four years on the Western Front. He showed me his army book. This man strongly sympathizes with the Germans, but he is and remains a Pole. He is in deep despair on account of the horrifying cruelties, the bestial brutalities that are being committed by the Germans in the ghetto. One must ask time and again, how is it possible that our people harbors such bestial riffraff? Were criminals and psychopaths released from prisons and insane asylums and used here as bloodhounds? No, these people are occupying positions of some responsibility in the state. At the bottom of human beings, there is tremendous evil and bestiality, Bosheit und Tierhaftigkeit. These instincts come to the fore when they are allowed to unfold without restraint. These low instincts are actually required to carry out the murders, the killings of the Jews and Poles. The merchant has business relationships with the Jews in the ghetto, therefore he gets to go there quite often. He says that it is very difficult to take, nicht zu ertragen, what he sees there. He dreads going there. He rides through the streets in a rickshaw. He sees how a Gestapo man pushes a group of men women and children into the doorway of the building and then shoots deliberately and without taking aim into this heap of human beings. Ten people are dead or wounded. A man runs away, he aims his pistol at him, but he's out of bullets. The wounded are dying, no one helps them. The doctors have already been deported or killed and they are actually supposed to die. One doesn't believe any of this even though it is true. Two such animals were riding in the same tramway as I. They were holding whips and came from the ghetto. I would have liked to push those dogs under the train. What cowards we are, we who want to be better, that we are allowing all of this to happen. That's why we too will be punished. Our innocent children will also be affected by this because we are incurring guilt by allowing such evil to happen.
In Rosenfeld's original German, that last sentence you just heard, we are incurring guilt for allowing such evil to happen, is extraordinary. Because the word Rosenfeld uses for evil is the German word Frevel. It's a religious term and it means the violation of the sacred, Schändung des Heiligen. The evil the Germans perpetrate, their killings, Rosenfeld regards as a violation of holiness, that is of God's holiness. Rosenfeld had a very strong sense that the deliberate murder of the Jews was a crime not just against humanity, but a crime against God. It violated what God had decreed to be sacred, human life. A year later, after the defeat, the defeat of the German Sixth Army at Stalingrad, the war had turned against them. Paradoxically, each defeat made the Germans accelerate their war against the Jews. Rosenfeld, who was still in Warsaw, was thrown into the deepest despair. He wrote in his diary on July 6, 1943. Why does God permit this horrible war with its gruesome human sacrifices? One need think only of the horrendous airstrikes, the terror felt by innocent civilians, the bestial brutality with which the prisoners in the concentration camps are treated, the murder of hundreds of thousands of Jews by the Germans. Is God guilty? Why does he not intervene? Why does he allow these things to happen? One could ask those questions, and one doesn't have an answer. We are easily inclined to find that the fault lies with someone else, rather than to search for the fault in ourselves. God allows evil to happen because humanity itself bears responsibility for suffering now the consequences of evil and imperfection. When the Nazis came to power, we did nothing to prevent it. We betrayed our ideals, the ideal of personal liberty of democratic freedom, of religious freedom. The workers went along, the church looked on, the middle class was too cowardly, and so were the leading intellectual classes. We allowed the unions to be destroyed, and various religious denominations to be suppressed, and we allowed the press to be gagged. In the end, we allowed ourselves to be driven to war and war. We were content. But ideals are not betrayed without punishment. We must now suffer the consequences. Rosenfeld was not the only one for whom the murder of the Jews and the deepening, and the deepening war raised existential questions. The majority of the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto were fairly secular people. But there were also many deeply religious Jews. The Eastern European Jews, uh, for Eastern European Jews, to suffer persecution was not new, but the total extinction threatened by the Germans was persecution on a different scale. Yet the religious response was traditional. It was an affirmation of faith. By upholding faith, one did not descend to the level of animals. By acknowledging God's greatness to the end, one participated in his holiness. The Jewish tradition sees heroism in the sanctification of God's name in situations of great personal stress. Two songs on this subject of faith have survived. One of them, Oibnit Pin and Muna, survived only as a fragment. It declares, if there is no God, it doesn't matter what I do. If there's no assurance of redemption, there is no point in living. The second song, Ani Ma'amin, is an affirmation of faith based on the 13 Articles of Faith by Moses Maimonides. The melody is based on a nigan from the Hasidim of Mochitz and it was composed by Azriel Dovid Fastol.
1962, Edward Reicher, a doctor who had survived the Warsaw Ghetto and his deportation to Majdanek, wrote in the preface to his memoirs, which were published in France, if my memoirs contain no accusations and express no desire for revenge, it is because a man who has traveled through hell can no longer feel such things. All his feelings are dead. Nor does one find in his memoirs a hatred that poisons men's hearts and destroys all hope of cooperation and peace among them. The man who has written these memoirs has aged. His hopes no longer belong to him. He has entrusted them to the next generation, for only the young can attempt to overcome the vile actions of the past. We conclude our commemoration of the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto with a performance of a section prayer from Ernest Bloch's sweet Jewish life. Ernest Bloch was born in Geneva in 1880 and studied violin with various teachers in Europe, including Ivan Kno at the Hoch Conservatory in Frankfurt, where Ronald Kutcher would also study 70 years later. Bloch settled in the United States in 1916. In the 1920s, he became the musical director at the newly formed Cleveland Institute of Music, where Ronald Kutcher would be vice president of academic affairs 70 years later. I am mentioning these connections because such continuities make one hopeful about the future. The presenters and performers tonight come from three continents and speak four different native languages. There's very little one can take away from the ashes of the Holocaust, but what, that we have come together in friendship for 90 minutes of commemoration is not nothing. We began this program with a song composed, and here comes the date again, 1924, in Warsaw, expressing hope for universal peace. Play me a song about peace, and may be real peace and not an illusion. May all nations, great and small, live without wars. Let us sing the little song together as good friends, as children of one mother and one father. We conclude with Anna's Lost Prayer, composed also in 1924, in Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you. 